Hello and welcome to our Facebook Live, or if you're watching it again, our YouTube Live on the Sa the crimes of Santa and Rudolph. We're here with Dr. Michael Fay. Uh, Dr. Michael Fay, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, so I'm Dr. Michael Fay. I'm a lecturer here at the Keele Law School. Uh, I'm an area, my area of specialism is mental health and medical law, but I also do some very bizarre criminal law too. Fantastic. And we're currently in the Moot Court, which is a, a great space. Can you tell us about this space a bit more? So the Moot Court is used for uh, mooting mainly. Uh, we do do a bit of teaching here. Mooting is when you get the chance to represent an argument in court as if you were in the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal, on appeal, dealing with legal issues, and it gives you a great chance to get used to public speaking and advocacy as part of your law degree. So we have a quick pan of the room, have a look around. It's a great, it's a really great space, isn't it? And does it come in and useful in teaching? And it's it's very useful in teaching and very useful with the the mooting in particular because it gives you the real courtroom feel. And you often get um, people from the legal profession coming in to do um, to judge the competitions and to actually take part in the competition. So the students get expertise from lawyers, not just from the academics in the law school. Brilliant. So um, I have always wondered. Um, when you uh, leave your mince pies off and Santa mm -hmm. slides down the chimney, um, how is it that he's not classed as a burglar? And how does he get away with, uh, with sliding down your chimney and entering your house and eating those mince pies? So that's a very, very good question. And that is all to do with the crime of burglary. Now, burglary is this idea that you enter the property of somebody else or part of a building with the intention to commit another crime. So burglary itself is, is the intention to do something other uh, else that's illegal. So it could be theft, it could be grievous bodily harm or criminal damage. And having entered the building with the intention to do one of those crimes, you then steal or cause GBA to cause that harm to somebody uh, with the, and then cause criminal damage. So the key kind of things that you're looking for when you're trying to do Santa, if we look at the next slide, is whether he's entered a building whether he's in a building or a part of a building, is he a trespasser and does he have the intention to commit another crime? In order to enter as a crime of burglary, he has to be in, has to have made substantial and effective entry into a building. But partial entry is enough. So the fact that he's stuck halfway in the chimney, for example, or leaning through the windows would be enough to have entered the building. And you only need to enter part of a building. So if you're in a place where it says, you know, staff only behind the till or something like that, that's still entry into part of a building. So it's a very broad idea of, of entry into a, a building or part of that. And that includes things like motorhomes, caravans, or even houseboats. So it's possible to commit burglary on all different spaces. Here, we'll look at the next slide. But what's key is that he needs to be a trespasser. And this is where Santa's crimes become really interesting, whether or not he's a burglar. Because when you leave the mince pies out, and you're expecting Santa to come, you're giving him almost Im an implied permission. So you're not giving him a written permission to be in your house, but by acting in a certain way, you're giving him an implied permission to be there. So think of the postman. When you have the postman coming up to your door and he puts letters into your letterbox, you haven't given him strict permission to do that. But because you put in a letterbox and you're expecting post, you're giving him implied permission to turn up into your house. So by leaving somebody's mince pies out, by leaving somebody, you know, the stockings to fill up on the mantelpiece and the chimney, you're actually giving him a degree of consent to enter the building. So, and, but there's a limit to that. You can enter the building and you can enter part of the building and have permission. So the postman can come up to your door and put the letters through your letterbox. But if the postman was to open the door, go in and make himself a cup of tea, he would be going beyond the limits of what he's actually been allowed to do. In the same way that if you have a party and you've got people in your house and they decide to go and explore your bedrooms upstairs rather than stay in the party, they would then go beyond what you've given them permission to do and become a trespasser. So when you hang up your stockings, you give him permission to turn up, which means that he may not be a burglar because he may not be trespassing. But as soon as he goes rummaging through your cupboards or borrows something from the garage like a chainsaw or a lawnmower, he would then be trespassing because he's going to a space that's not what he's allowed to do. Once we've established that he is trespassing, so he's going into the cupboards, he's taking the mince pies out of cupboards, and he's not doing what you've implied that he can do, you've then got to work out whether he actually has the intention to do something that is a crime that makes you a burglar. So theft, grievous bodily harm, serious harm to somebody, 
or criminal damage. So you've got to have the intention to commit trespass in the first place, which is easy to know, easy to show if you're opening cupboard doors or going into the garage or something when you don't have permission to do that. And then you've got to have the intention to commit the other crime. Now this is known in criminal law as mens rea. Mens rea means guilty mind, and a lot of crimes have two parts. There's what we call the guilty act, actus reus, and the guilty mind, mens rea. So you need to do something which is unlawful, steal, murder, criminal damage, but in order to be able to prove there's a crime, you need to also have the level of intention to do it, the, the guilty mind, the mens rea. If somebody has the mens rea and commits the wrong act, then they're guilty of a crime. And with burglary, they need to have the intention to trespass and the intention to cause theft, grievous bodily harm or criminal damage. And if you can prove all of that, you can then find somebody guilty. For Santa, you'd be most interested in theft. Theft's dealt with under the Theft Act 1968, and it has these five different elements to proving theft. So it's not just as easy as saying you've snicked something from me. You've actually got quite a detailed law on what it means to commit theft. So you have to be dishonest, you have to appropriate property belonging to another, and you have to intend to permanently deprive. So that means, going through each one of those bits in turn, that if you're dishonest, well, first of all, let's look at property, actually. If we look at the next slide. What we're talking about theft and taking property, property includes money and all properties, real or personal, like credits in a bank account, money in a bank account, or shares in a company. So it includes everything that we might think of as property. So you can steal shares in a company. You can steal mince pies from the cupboard. You can be guilty of theft for all sorts of different reasons and for all sorts of different property. In order to appropriate that property, you have to do something with it that the owner, only the owner could do. So you could sell it, you could keep it, you could damage it, you could destroy it. If you do anything that the owner can do, you've appropriated the property from them. Property belongs to another when it's in their possession. So for example, you take library books out of the library. When they're in your possession, that's property that belongs to you. If you steal those library books from somebody else, you've appropriated property belonging to another. And in that, what that means is that if I loan you my car and then take it back, I could technically be guilty of theft because I can steal property that even that I actually own because it's in the possession of another. So if Santa takes the mince pies out of the cupboard or he takes something from the garage, he's definitely taking property that belongs to another because it's in their possession, it's their property, and he's doing something that only the owner could do. He's eating the mince pies or he's taking the chainsaw or lawnmower from the garage. The real interesting bit about theft, though, is whether or not somebody's dishonest. And this has a lot of arguments with criminal lawyers about what it means to be dishonest. So there's two different definitions of dishonesty. We have one in statute and one in common law. Now, common law is made by judges, so it's made through the decisions of the courts, whereas statutes are made by acts of parliament, so the debates that we see happening um, between the government and other members of parliament. Common law means a person is dishonest if they behave in a way that they think is dishonest by the standards of the reasonable person. So what you and I would understand are, as being dishonest, but also they have to realize this. So there's a really interesting and really difficult question about, does the person know they're actually doing something dishonest? And I remember having um, a really detailed debate about this with my own criminal law lecturer when I was doing my degree, about whether or not the person who walks into a church and takes from the poor box is being dishonest, and whether or not they actually understand that. because taking something that is meant for the poor, if they're poor. Under the Theft Act, though, somebody has to, is guilty of being uh, dishonest if they appropriate property belonging to another and they believe that he has, in law, the right to deprive it. Uh, or, or, sorry, if they're not guilty of being dishonest if he believes he has a right in law to deprive the other's office, if he believes he would have the other's consent, and if he believes the person whom the property belonged cannot be discovered. So if you're taking mince pies from a, a dish that's been left on the side, you would very much say that I believe I have the consent of the other person because I've left them out. The glass of milk, the carrot for Rudolph, the mince pies. I've left them out and there's obviously consent there for me to take them. But if I go into the cupboard and take the other packets of mince pies, I don't necessarily have the consent. So dishonesty under the Theft Act is anything that doesn't fall into those three things. At common law, it's when you realise you're being dishonest and you know that that's dishonest by the standards of the reasonable person, which obviously creates huge amounts of debate about, well, what is dishonesty and who is a reasonable person? So Santa's problem is probably gonna be, providing he's, he's not taking anything out of cupboards, he's got the consent, 
he wouldn't be guilty of a crime. So if we have a look at the next one. The last thing he, you have to prove is that there's intention to permanently deprive. So he must have intended to take the property perm permanently. So borrowing without permission is not the same as theft. Um, if you've eaten, for example, the mince pies, well, you've permanently deprived them because you can't return them. But if he's borrowed the if he's borrowed the chainsaw or the lawnmower and intends to give it back, there's no intention to permanently deprive, so it would be something else. It wouldn't necessarily be theft. So if we think about the different things that we've talked about, have a look at the next slide. What's the difference between the three scenarios? If you've got somebody who's left out mince pies for Santa and he's taken them, well, he can understand, he could argue that there's consent there for him to take the mince pies. He probably isn't even a trespasser because you've hung up your stockings on the chimney as in the image. So you would be actually consenting to Santa coming into your house. If he goes rummaging through the cupboard, he's gone beyond what you've allowed him to do. He's no longer able to say that actually you, you were consenting to me taking the mince pies. He's now going through your personal property. And if he borrows something from the garage, he's definitely going way beyond what you've allowed him to do. So Santa probably isn't a criminal if he does what we expect him to do, but if he goes beyond that and does something else, rummages through your cupboards, rummages through your house, you would definitely be in a great deal of trouble. That clears it up. So because we leave the mince pies out for him, he's fine, yes. he's, he's safe. He has his tread quite quite carefully then, Santa. He does, he does. He's not, he's not, as, he's not as easy going as, as some may think, just no. sliding down a chimney, no. eating his mince pies and heading out. He's got to be, he's got, he's got to follow by some strict rules. Um, so what about looking at um, Santa's entourage, mm -hmm. uh, Rudolph and the rest of the reindeers? Um, they have to do quite a complex landing on the roof mm -hmm. of your house. And um, let's say it goes wrong one night, mm -hmm. and chips a few tiles, knocks mm -hmm. a few tiles off, breaks the drain pipe. Where does he, where does he end up there? Is, is, he, is that criminal damage or um, is that just an accident and you have to pay for it? Well, it could be criminal damage. And uh, let's have a look and, and see how that one would play out. So if we've got Rudolph, uh, who's landed on the roof and he's caused some he damage to grass or damage to the roof tiles or kicks down the chimney in temper. You've got three very different outcomes that could possibly happen. So we would be talking about criminal damage and criminal damage is dealt with under the Criminal Damage Act, which is from 1971, which is quite an old act now. And a person is said to have committed criminal damage if they, without lawful excuse, destroy or damage property that belongs to someone else and do so recklessly uh, with, with with the intent with recklessly whether or not that property would be destroyed or damaged. What that means, putting it into kind of plain speak, is essentially that you have to have property that belongs to another, it has to be destroyed or damaged, the person has to intend or be reckless about that damage, and they must not have a lawful excuse. And that's the key thing. If you've got a lawful excuse, there's potential to actually not be guilty of criminal damage. Now, we talked about property with theft and Santa, and properties very similar in some respects when you're talking about criminal damage. But it differs in one particular way. It's only tangible property. So shares and, and money in a bank account can't be criminally damaged, whereas it can be stolen. But here you have to have property of what we call a tangible nature. So realistically, we're talking about the chimney, the grass, the roof of the house, things that are actually physical in nature. Belonging to another is very similar to theft. All property offences have a good deal of overlap. But belonging to another means that it's, you know, somebody else has custody or control of it. They have a proprietary right, so they own it. So I own my house, I have a proprietary right in my house. Or they're in charge, they have a charge on it. So that means that they've got a, a right against it in the land registry. Destroying or damaging it, well, it, this is a question of fact and degree, which means that it must be more than what we call in law de minimis. It means it must be more than trifling and trivial. Um, so chipping the paving wouldn't be enough. It has to be something more significant, but it can be permanent or temporary. So chalk outlines on paving could very well be criminal damage if you've done it sufficiently. Um, and any alteration to physical nature or property could amount to damage. And it depends on the effect on the owner, not necessarily the effect of what it's actually have. So what about Santa's footprints going through the house? So if he's left, San if Santa's left his footprints in the house and they're muddy footprints walking through, you may very well have a criminal damage claim. Wow, okay. So he's got to be careful about whether or not his boots are clean as so well. So as he gets into his, mm -hmm. his sleigh, he's got to clean up his boots yep. and get ready for the next house. Yeah, unless of course he has lawful excuse. Right. 
You've also got to have the intentional recklessness. And we, we mentioned this with theft, the you know, intention to permanently deprive, or the, and with burglary, the intention to trespass. And intention means you, you foresee the outcome and you desire the outcome. So if somebody intent, intends to do a crime, they foresee what's going to happen, they know that's the outcome, and they want that outcome to happen. And the, the crime we often talk about that with is murder. Recklessness is the means that you're aware of a risk that, that something will happen, and you know that that might occur, and you take a risk even though it's unreasonable to do so. So I don't care whether that window gets broken or those tiles get knocked off the roof, but I still do, and I still do the, the act that might do that. So if you do all of that, then you've got a, a, a crime of criminal damage. But you can have a lawful excuse. And there's two different parts to lawful excuse. You can believe that at the time the person who owned the property or controlled the property would have consented to destruction or damage and had they known that that was going to happen. Or you destroyed it and destroyed the property uh, to protect others or to protect um, the property of others. If you're talking about Santa's reindeer or Santa walking through the house, you're talking about the fact that you believe they would consent to that destruction of property. So they would consent to the, they would agree to have some muddy footprints on their carpet because Santa's coming through. Or on the flip side, they would consent to having a bit of uh, some furrows in the grass or a few roof tiles knocked off because they've, they know that Santa's reindeer is going to land on their roof. If they've got lawful excuse, the first two wouldn't necessarily be criminal damage, so causing damage to grass, causing damage to roof tiles if they would consent, because maybe there's a benefit to knowing that Santa's going to land in your garden, um, then that actually would be a lawful excuse. But kicking down the chimney, there would be no lawful excuse there. So if you're actually doing something uh, that damages in temper, it wouldn't necessarily be lawful excuse. A good example of lawful excuse that you often get, and one that has a, a good debate, is, is Banksy. Is Banksy, a bit like Santa, you know, we don't necessarily know what goes on with him, he's a bit of a mysterious character, but when Banksy paints on your walls, that's technically criminal damage, but because it increases the value of your property, would you consent to him doing that in the first place, so would you then not complain it's criminal damage, so does he have a lawful excuse? So I guess it's, it's all down to the person who owns the property, whether yep. they want to pursue... It's uh, the effect on the person that matters. Right. So if you increase the value of the property by landing your reindeer on the roof or by painting on the walls, then it wouldn't be criminal damage. But if somebody comes in and paints a tag on the wall and it decreases the value, then the effect would be negative on the person. So it very much depends on the influence of that on the individual. Fantastic. Let's have another, let's have another walk around as we wrap up the stream. Um, so thank you, Dr. Michael Fay. That is our first Facebook Live. We've got a few more coming up throughout December with other academics from across the university. We'll keep spinning around to show this lovely room off. Um, if you are interested in Laura at Keel, check out our course pages. Uh, you could come and visit this on an open day. Um, do you get to wear these as well uh, in the moot courtroom? You do occasionally get to wear the outfits in the moot courtroom, yeah. Beautiful. Uh, I'm sure this would suit me well. Um, so thank you very much again. Thank you for watching, uh, and we'll see you on the next one.